So welcome to this special SciDevNet debate, uh, where we will be considering how population data can be leveraged in a time of crisis. My name is Fiona Broom. I'm the acting global editor at SciDevNet, and I'm joining you today from sunny London. Uh, if you're not familiar with us, SciDevNet is the world's leading source of reliable and authoritative news, views and analysis about science and technology for global development. And our mission is to use independent journalism to help individuals and organisations apply science to decision making in order to drive equitable, sustainable development and poverty reduction. So thanks again to all of you for joining us today. Um, today's debate is supported by TRENDS, which is the thematic research network on de data and statistics, which is part of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And last week, TRENDS released a new report on behalf of the PopGrid Data Collaborative. Um, the report is called Leaving No One Off the Map, a Guide for Gridded Population Data for Sustainable Development. Um, this new report presents an overview analysis and recommendations for the use of gridded population data sets in a wide range of application areas, many of which we'll dig into during this debate. Uh, you can access their report via a link which I'll share just shortly in the chat box. Um, before we begin the discussion, I'll just mention a couple of practical matters. Uh, questions from the audience are warmly welcomed. You should be able to see that there's a Q&A option at the bottom or the top of your screens. Please use this to ask questions and I'll do my best to open them up to the panel. Um, and uh, in the top right of your window, you should be able to have uh, some view options. So you can choose to view the current speaker or view the panel in a grid. Speaking of grids, let me introduce our gridded population data experts on our panel. Joining us today, we've got Jessica Espy. Uh, she's the director of SDSN Trends and the senior advisor to the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Alex DeSherbinen is the associate director for science applications and a senior research scientist at the Center for International Earth Science Information Network, which is known as CSIN at Columbia University. Andrea Gon is a researcher at the World Pop Project and a professor in the Development of Geography, uh, sorry, Department of Geography and Geosciences at the University of Louisville. And Idris Jaeger is the Assistant Director of the Strategic Space Applications Department at Nigeria's National Space Research and Development Agency. And he's also a member of the Grid 3 Nigeria Secretariat. Um, so let's jump right in by asking what is gridded population data and why is it important and how does gridded population data relate to censuses? Um, Jessica, as your team has just released a new report on this topic, um, perhaps you could kick us off by telling us what gridded population data is. Sure. Um, hello everyone, morning, afternoon and evening. Um, it's lovely to be with you all and thank you for joining us. I know uh, these virtual events are not quite the same as in-person meetings, but um, at least it gives us the opportunity to connect with so many of you from all around the world. So much appreciated that you could join us today. Um, so SDSN Trends, uh, of which I'm the director, commissioned this report that Fiona just mentioned, uh, leaving no one off the map. And our ambition with it was to really try and make um, gridded population data much better understood um, and much more accessible, particularly for um, scientists, academics, but perhaps most importantly, national government stakeholders who are looking to deliver services um, or provide interventions, uh, particularly obviously right now in the context of a crisis, and need really accurate uh, population data in order to do that. So traditionally, population data is derived from a census, usually conducted every 10 years, uh, where resources and, and capacity allows. Um, and that is, as I'm sure you will know, a sort of survey, um, literally often knocking on doors to ascertain how many people are living in different households and their whereabouts and so on. Gridded population data um, enables us to sort of take this a step further and actually take um, that underlying census information and distribute it in rows and columns of grid cells, which are defined by latitude and longitude. Um, and that can give us a much better understanding of, of where people are, groups of people are settled. Um, and it can be combined with lots of other data sources like satellite imagery and so on, so that you can have much more timely updates or estimates of population distribution and change. Um, perhaps the most important and most basic point is that you are um, putting the population data essentially in a grid cell on a map, um, as I said, defined by latitude and longitude. And that means that you can overlay any other data sets that are um, spatially 
defined. So it essentially gives you the opportunity to look at population dynamics and people, where people are in their lived experiences overlaid with lots of other data sets. So you could use that information to get a much better sense of access to services. You could use that information to get a much better sense of people's vulnerability to certain events, climactic shocks, um, and so on, you know, even, even pandemic spread. So it's, it's really taking population data and making it much more um, usable um, and, and much more sort of applied for many of the day-to-day -day policy and decision-making challenges that um, many governments face. And we thought it was particularly important to kind of explain that and explain all the different tools that are out there in this new report. And obviously it seems particularly pertinent right now in the context of COVID-19 and in the midst of a, a crisis to really make sure that we have the best available estimates of people's whereabouts um, and, and a good sense of the kinds of services and help and support that they can access at a time like now. So um, this report seems all the more uh, you know, relevant. So with that, I'll, I'll stop and pass over to my colleagues. Thanks. Thanks. And um, Alex, uh, how was gridded population data developed? So a bit of history. Um, I think uh, Jessica did a very nice job of describing sort of the utility of, of gridded population data in terms of um, the, the original idea was to liberate data that was originally in what we call vector format. So that means that you had these administrative areas of various sizes um, from census units or they could have been counties or districts or provinces. And um, the data that um, are in that format become much harder to combine with other data. So really you have to go back to probably the late 80s and early 90s when geographic information systems, which is the primary tool that is used to process and to understand the distribution of population in relation to other variables came into their own. And uh, what gridded population data allowed us to do by dividing people into grid cells rather than irregularly shaped uh, units, we could easily combine data across multiple uh, formats. It really came out of the environmental and earth science communities that were using remote sensing data and early gridded data sets of precipitation or other biophysical variables. And having the data all in a common format made processing a lot easier. Uh, in general, uh, uh, computationally, it's a lot easier to process data that are in a gridded format than it is uh, in a vector format. So uh, you can then look at populations uh, across administrative units instead of having uh, to kind of understand population in a watershed based on the administrative units within that watershed, you could actually, or if they're administrative units that actually didn't perfectly align with the watershed, uh, you could actually just sum up all the grid cells within a watershed and be able to quickly analyze the data and the population distribution within that watershed then much more easily than if you had it in the original vector format. So that's a little bit of the history behind gridding population. And as time has gone on, what we've seen is that it actually emerged from the earth and environmental science community to become a very useful tool for the development and for the humanitarians who need accurate data to begin to understand the distribution of population uh, in different contexts and in, in uh, say during the nighttime, during the daytime, uh, and, and in real time sometimes to be able to better understand where people are in relation to various hazards and in relation to various services. I'll stop there. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, that moves quite um, cleanly into our next discussion point, which is, is gridded population data particularly loose, useful in certain fields and certain circumstances? So for example, can it be used by governments or organizations to meet the sustainable development goals or respond to the COVID-19 crisis? Um, Alex, one of your teams has created the Global COVID-19 Viewer, which is using some of these data sets. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Hi, Ben. Yes, absolutely. So um, I work at Season, which is a center at the Earth Institute, Columbia University, but one of our uh, major projects is uh, the management of a data center called the NASA Socioeconomic Data and Application Center. And so under the, the 
that project, which we call CDAC, uh, we developed a, a data viewer that allows people to understand uh, the actual incidents and trends in uh, cases and mortality for COVID-19 in relation to population density and age structure. Uh, both factors are important in understanding the evolution of COVID uh, and the risk factors. So uh, we know that in dense urban environments like where I live right now in New York City, uh, the spread of the disease has been much more rapid. We also know in more uh, in populations that are uh, older, um, such as in Northern Italy, where you have a very high proportion of the population that's in the uh, over 65 age category, that the spread has also been, and the, the mortality rates have been exceptionally high. So the, the viewer basically brings the COVID data into uh, alignment with and in the context of uh, different, um, both population density and different density classes in urban areas and also uh, the age structure of the population, which is a risk factor. Thanks so much for that. Um, Andrea, how scripted population data used in relation to climate change and other land and environmental issues? Thank you, Fiona. Uh, and thank you all for um, being on this uh, call today. It's a pleasure to be here. And I apologize if you hear any uh, airplanes. I can, you would think the economy was thriving based on the number of planes that are currently flying over me. <laughs> but uh, specific to the question, so one of the things that I think we should emphasize when thinking about using gridded population data is in contrast to relying just on the census data, the gridded product gives you these consistent comparable units of analysis that make it much more tractable for uh, inserting that kind of data into any kind of um, analysis or application. Uh, it's much more flexible in terms of being able to use it. And so in thinking about examples related to climate or land use, uh, you can use the gridded products in a way that allows you to quickly assess populations at risk associated to something like sea level rise um, or maybe potential of flooding related to a hurricane that falls on land and get a quick assessment associated with um, how many people how, like the count of people or the density, identifying areas where high densities exist for where flooding might uh, be coincident. And more importantly, some of these gridded population data sets that are highlighted in the SDSN report uh, go further than just those total population counts, but allow you to break down age and sex um, so that you can start even teasing out the most vulnerable populations uh, for a particular type of event. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Idris, how are you using gridded population data at Nigeria's Space Research and Development Agency and also at Grid3? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, gridded population uh, data sets uh, provides, as earlier mentioned, it provides uh, uh, age and sex, which is, uh, uh, which is a demographic breakdown according to age and sex. So at the Space Agency, we do a lot of collaborations with uh, government and non-governmental agencies, and also with uh, Great 3 Nigeria project. So what we did earlier on uh, our case study or the use case is on education. Now, uh, we, we did a project with a Universal Basic Education Commission where we started from scratch because one of the issues in Nigeria is even having a reliable data set. So when you have an estimate of population, you need a reliable data set or reliable population counts to compare with. So having that uh, data set generated on uh, education where we collected data on schools, over 120,000 schools, basic education schools, both public and private, uh, Grid Tree project uh, came in to develop an interface 
And that interface was uh, basically applied the graded population estimates where the distribution of, uh, the distribution of uh, population within uh, settlements were highlighted and the catchment, that becomes a catchment area for population and for schools. We were able to identify schools that are around the catchment area and then school age population was derived out using the graded population data sets. And we were able to show the distribution of schools around and then the relationship between other services, maybe healthcare, uh, education and other infrastructure. So we will be able to say that children walk certain distance from their homes to schools or from their homes to healthcare centers. Those are the kind of use cases we are looking at. And then education in particular, it's important in Nigeria at this point. It is believed that citing schools or locations of schools, it's uh, done politically without uh, documentary evidence. So graded population data uh, makes it possible to allow policy makers or decision makers to have documentary evidence for locating service facilities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jessica and also Andrea, perhaps um, you could speak to the connection with sustainable development goals. Um, Andrea, perhaps you can begin. Uh, sure. I, um, I just wanted to follow up with the, the comments associated with applications related to land and climate that really gridded population data is relevant to all SDG efforts. Um, I think that in order to meet the goal sets that are laid out, you have uh, you have to be able to identify a certain percentage of that population that is tied to access to something or specific resources, um, or you're trying to achieve a certain level associated with social, economic, or physical health. And to do that, you have to know where people are located. And so I think gridded data gives you a resource that um, can be uh, a really powerful tool for sort of giving you that baseline of that demographic baseline um, or that demographic mm -hmm. evidence for being able to start measuring uh, and moderate, monitoring certain types of uh, SDGs. Uh, I'm also affiliated with the Wolpot Project and they have a lot of uh, work currently going on that is specific towards uh, this kind of work for looking at vulnerable populations or world pot data is being used by various, organi various organizations for um, specifically identifying uh, most vulnerable populations or populations at risk for uh, them being able to make certain decisions associated with resource allocation. Um, a really good example is um, where uh, the Gates Foundation is relying on gridded population data for basically uh, creating uh, 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 plans on the ground for how to disseminate vaccinations related to polio. Uh, another example is where um, uh, platforms are being developed by various research organizations and development organizations for vulnerability assessments, specifically leveraging those gridded age and sex uh, data products. Uh, and looking um, in areas like Africa uh, for being able to identify uh, certain populations of interest. And all of this links back into uh, various school sets or efforts that would tie to the SDGs. Great, thank you. And uh, Alex, did you want to yeah, share just, something? Thanks, I just wanted to add to um, some of what's been said that um, so the reason um, the SDGs fundamentally are looking at trying to disaggregate uh, the, the goals and really the whole idea behind leaving no one behind, which obviously is uh, one of the ways that we came up with the title for leaving no one off the map was that the SDGs fundamentally are seeking to reach everyone, the whole population in a country. And the reality is that, um, you know, historically development has been greatest in urban areas and areas where there's greater infrastructure and services and perhaps where governments have been paying more attention. 
Uh, and there are a lot of people in rural areas that fundamentally have, in a sense, been left off the map and haven't really received the access and, and the resources needed in order to fully develop. So the whole ethos behind the SDGs is to reach those people in the, in the hardest to reach areas. Um, unfortunately, the way censuses have released data in many developing countries and even in some developed countries is um, with very coarse, um, at a very coarse level, meaning that they provide data maybe at a provincial level or even maybe down to district, but still within that you have very little idea of where people are located. So one thing we haven't really touched on yet in this dialogue is the fact that there are several different data products that actually model where the population distribution is based on our understanding and empirical relationships between say factors such as where building density is highest, where nighttime lights may be brightest, where uh, roads are and where roads are not located and things of that sort that actually help us to actually model the population and put people on the map in ways that actually make it easier to find them and then to actually provide services such as the things that Andrea was talking about earlier, such as vaccination, such as healthcare, education, which Idris touched on. So the, the, I think a, a core point needs to be made that the reason we model the data and that there are several different modeled population products that are covered by this and, and addressed by this report and described in the report is that if you were just to take the, the census data right from the census agencies, you often wouldn't be able to locate very, people very well in space. Also, temporarily speaking, censuses often occur just once every decade. In some countries, frankly, there hasn't been a census in several decades because of war, because of other factors that have resulted in essentially a lack of capacity to count their populations. So while gridded data are not perfect, what they do allow you to do is extrapolate in some cases where there haven't been censuses and also in essence place people um, where they're most likely to be on the map based on the various, uh, our understanding of where people are in relation to infrastructure, into in buildings and other things that influence the distribution of the population. I hope that helps. Great, thank you. Um, you mentioned the various products that are available. Um, Jessica, could you perhaps explain what we mean when we're talking about products in this context? Sure. I mean, I'm probably not the best place to do this. It's probably more Andrew or Alex who, are, who work with these products on a daily basis. Um, I will in a sec, but I, the one thing I wanted to just add is maybe just an illustrative kind of example of, of how one of these data sets is being used to transport the SDGs. So I think Andrea summarized it really nicely in sort of talking about the fact that actually this data is fundamental for all of the sustainable development goals, whether you're measuring poverty or gender or you know, climate change, you need to have a good sense of demographics, you need to know where people are, where they're living and so on, and, and also a good sense of um, their different disaggregated characteristics, their age, their gender, their different types of vulnerability, and so on. And, and that's why this data is so important. Um, but as I mentioned at the beginning, and a very basic point is that you are essentially grid, you are gridding this data, right? You are putting it into um, pixels or cells that essentially allows you to overlay it with lots of other data sets. Um, and in doing that, there's lots of really interesting and amazing, you know, ways that we can use this information to support monitoring of sustainable development. So a, a very basic example is you know, I think everyone's aware of the fact that there are huge air pollution challenges around the world and high density cities, particularly, we see very high emissions and so on. And that in you know, many countries around the world, air pollution is a major concern. It's also something that's identified in the SDGs. But at the moment, we don't have very good estimates of kind of people's individual vulnerability. You can have one sensor sitting in one street that will tell you, you know, the vulnerability of the population if you happen to be walking past the sensor. But it doesn't give you a really good sense of, you know, in total, how many people are likely to be exposed to that kind of thing. And so just by, by way of example, one thing we can now do is using air pollution data from the UN Environment Programme, which is essentially visualised to show us the flows of different types of, uh, of pollutants and how air quality is changing with weather patterns. You can overlay that with your gridded population data to actually have a really timely sense of the people who are exposed to 
essentially dangerous air at different times in different places and have actual quantitative numbers of how many people are likely to be vulnerable. So examples like that of, you know, and similarly, you could do the same looking at overlaying um, something like health service data. So access to health services or health service quality information um, with a good health infrastructure survey, you could overlay that with your gridded population data to have a really good sense of how many women around the world can access reproductive health services, how many women around the world can get contraception or men can get contraceptive services and so on. And a lot of that data, shockingly, we just don't have today. I mean, right now, as we speak, there is no globally comparable measure of access to reproductive health services around the world that is available with any timeliness. Um, you know, you can't, the, the, the closest estimates we've got are at least a few years out of date. And if you're trying to respond to something as urgent as, you know, family planning and um, general health care, not having that kind of data set is just incredible, unfathomable, really. And this gives us the potential to do that, to kind of generate these kinds of products. So it's, yeah, I think hugely exciting. Um, in terms of the products we're talking about, um, there are a range of different research groups and entities out there that are using slightly different methods to grid population data. Um, so, and as Alex has already alluded to, they do, some do it with different models. Um, so they might factor in, as he said, night lights or infrastructure to estimate uh, where their, their distribution might be slightly wrong, i.e. you could have a very high density environment where there are lots more people living. Um, then, you know, just an initial grid spread might suggest. Um, so it gives you a little bit more nuance to make sure that that's as accurate as possible. But anyway, there are a range of different products that are discussed in the report um, and all their different nuances, so I won't be able to do them justice. But um, I will hand over to Andrew and Alex if they want to give a couple of examples of, of the differences. We've actually um, had a question come in from someone in the audience, Benedict Cotoni, um, who's asking, has this technology on gridded population data been used by developing countries in mapping climate change vulnerability issues? Uh, and if yes, how is the intake of the technology? Because it looks like a powerful tool in planning. Uh, you mentioned um, air pollution there. Andrea, Alex Idris, um, would you like to respond to this? Actually, uh, climate vulnerability mapping is one of my research areas, so I'll, I'll jump in and I'm sure Andrea has additional things to say. I think you mentioned, Andrea, already some application areas related to flood risk and flood hazard vulnerability. Um, you know, so gridded population data are foundational and important in that area. Uh, often what we want is actually additional details about the population, such as uh, their education levels, their income levels, their poverty levels, uh, you know, their assets, whether they have, um, you know, and some of those factors can actually be obtained from additional sources, such as the demographic and health surveys, or the multiple indicator and cluster surveys, or other national level surveys. But the census data are really foundational in terms of understanding, say, relationships between um, population density. Uh, Idris mentioned that some of the population products, two of them actually gridded population of the world and WorldPOP have age structure data. In, uh, so you can actually look at particular age, uh, age groups. And if, for instance, uh, you're concerned about, let's say, flood risk, um, you may be particularly interested in children under the age of 10. Uh, or under the age of five, and you might want to map that. So these are foundational data sets for understanding the relationship between population variables and uh, risk of various climate hazards. Thanks, Alex. Um, would anybody else like to respond? Idris or Andrea? Uh, hello. Uh, I will take us back to the products. Uh, the earlier question that was asked, uh, it talks about the products, which uh, I think was not answered. There are a number of products developed, about seven or so. Uh, one, I, I, let me quickly just mention them. Graded Population of the World, Global Rural Urban Mapping Project, Global Human Settlement Pro Layer, uh, World Pub, Land Scan, world population estimates and high resolution settlement layer. So these are all estimates of population greeted developed. And there are two ways in developing this. You either use the top bottom approach where you use the uh, whole census figure and disaggregate to grids 
or you use the bottom top approach where you do a micro census, get a, a population of small areas, and then estimates to have a greeded population. So there are a number of reasons also why uh, government uh, agencies or non-governmental will choose a particular product to use. One of these is the modeling approach. What you need to look at is how did they arrive at this? Will this suit what I want to do? And then also apart from that, you need to understand uh, the models and how they compare against each other. You can have two different uh, products uh, use them for a use case study and then compare the results and see. So these are some of the products and how I think they are being used because each data set is based on different uh, underlying uh, assumptions. You can assume and then uh, whatever the assumption is, it determines the output of the grid. So Definitely no two products will give you the same estimation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Idris. Andrea, did you want to um, follow on from that? Yeah, uh, Idris, I'm really happy that you brought that up because I think that those are some really important points. And I was thinking while other conversation was happening that it's really important to recognize that none of these data sets are perfect. They're all estimates of something that we want to try to capture as true on the ground, but there's no necessarily right answer. And speaking directly to uh, a question that was just posed about the accuracy that's addressed in these population uh, audits, it's, it's, a, it's a very challenging thing to do because essentially what you're trying to say is how accurate is my count or my density for a given grid cell at a given spatial resolution on the landscape. And I think that uh, the the SDNS the SDNS and report that that we're all sort of um, talking about here does a really nice job of sort of laying out like the, how far the sort of the data modeling community has come in terms of trying to advance that part of our understanding of just how how accurately these gridded products capture population distribution on the landscape, uh, but there's still a lot of work there to go. And so as Idris was just mentioning, there's actually, the, the report highlights one type of approach for creating these gridded products that's very much reliant on the census data. But as Alex was noting, if you have really coarse or really outdated census data, like decades old census data, how reliable are those numbers anyway in terms of creating a gridded product? Um, the, the report also notes some, uh, another type of technique that Idris also just mentioned, where you might rely on micro census data or household survey data coupled with um, geospatial uh, ancillary data and you, and, you, and you model it from the quote unquote ground up. So you're not relying on the census data for creating those maps. And so which maps are the best maps and which maps should you choose to use? Is a really great question, and I, um, yeah. I, I have a uh, like in the back of my head, all the way back from grad school. My my PhD advisor had a piece of paper in his room that would, that whenever you would walk in and ask a question, he would point to it, and what it said was what it said was dork, and what that meant was it depends on the research question, uh, and I think it's very true for the gridded products. Like it depends on what you want to do with the data as to which data set you should use. And the data products that are highlighted in the report range from this idea of very lightly modeled, so it's very much just reliant on the census data uh, and, and distributing those census counts into a, a finer, um, uh, uh, disaggregating those census counts that are linked to some admin <clears throat> unit, finer grid cells, and that's it. So very lightly modeled, so to speak, all the way to something that's much more uh, heavily modeled, which will rely on a statistical model and a bunch of additional uh, covariates for informing that distribution. Uh, and both of these approaches have value. Um, the more lightly modeled approach might be a value if you need a more rapid repeatable method for continually updating your, your demographic counts for a, a given area, which might pertain very much so to thinking about um, current, the current global situation. Um, the more heavily modeled approach 
if you really need to know just like very detailed um, assessments in terms of those estimates, then that might be the direction you might want to go. Uh, and I also think that the approach where you're not reliant on the census counts could become very important, especially as we move into the circa 2020 uh, period where we're, you know, where all these censuses around the world are on standstill or, you know, will not have the resources to accurately count people. And so what do you do with that? And so I think there's also a merging of these different kinds of approaches for, for how we go about essentially counting people uh, around the world. Thank you. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, I wonder if this might tie in with our next discussion point, which is um, if gridded population data is an underutilized tool, what do we need to do to connect policymakers and researchers? Um, Andrea, would you like to continue on there or? Um, I, I blinked because I realized I didn't directly answer the question about the accuracy <laughs> assessment. Uh, so let me answer that and then somebody who was focused on what you were just saying can follow up. Um, the, 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 the SDNS report also has a lot of references for papers where people have attempted to uh, to a, compare different gridded products. Uh, one typical approach is to do the modeling at a coarser level than census data is available and then compare the modeled output to the finer scale census data. So there's quite a few references in there that do that. And then there's other references in the report that might have access to finer scale micro census or household survey data that they can use as a way of sort of treating that data as the, the true, the true population count and then comparing it back to the model approaches. Thanks. Um, Jessica, I see that you've got your hand up. Yeah, sorry, it's just unmuting. Um, hi, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, on the question of how we try and encourage uptake, I mean, that's really linking the, the best advances from scientists and academia to public policy is kind of the, the mission and modus operandi of the whole of SDSN. Um, what we try to do is to bring together, um, you know, cutting edge scientists and researchers working on different sustainable development challenges and try and ensure that they are connected to feeding into and have the capacity um, to be able to support the government, really recognizing the fact that the sustainable development challenge is, is immense. Um, and, you know, no one government and the various ministries are going to be able to have the requisite expertise on all of these different issues and their intersectionalities and so on. So it's really important that, you know, in pursuing any of these sustainable development objectives, we work collaboratively, um, not only with actors across different sectors within government, but, you know, with, with experts and other third party actors where relevant. In terms of how we do that, I mean, our mission with this, this report really is a starting point of trying to raise awareness um, amongst a broader audience of, of many of these tools um, and their respective you know, contributions and values. Um, in terms of um, how we're planning on disseminating information about this, um, SDSN is working, we have uh, at the moment over a thousand, um, I believe it's close to a thousand five hundred universities and expert groups around the world. Um, who are members of us, so we'll be pushing it out and promoting it through our networks, encouraging them and their different research centres to look at it. But also, all of those networks are connected to government. Um, we make it a, a point of whenever we establish, um, we get a new member and we work in a specific country, we make sure that they're connected to the Ministry of Planning, um, whoever might be in charge of coordination of SDG, monitoring and performance and so on. Um, so that's been really a kind of a primary objective. I think another big opportunity presented by the SDGs um, for this is that they do encourage a, a multi-stakeholder and very participatory approach that's explicit in the actual agenda itself. Um, and it's been explicit in what we've seen in, in many of the national, uh, voluntary national reviews coming out of countries and how they're pursuing um, different sustainable development objectives. And using that momentum, that gives a really good entry point um, for academics, for scientists, for population and you know, demographic uh, researchers, demographers and so on to connect with government and say, look, you know, I, I have expertise in X, I understand these resources, Y, I can help you navigate what might be most relevant for different purposes um, and really help to work together on, on these different products. 
So um, that's how we as SDSN are doing it on a slightly more micro scale. Um, I think it would be interesting for us to talk about the Grid 3 project, uh, which is one very tangible example, and perhaps Alex can, or Idris can talk about that. Um, and from SDSN side, we're also one of the lead uh, partners on a project called Data for Now. And that's working with 10 countries around the world where we are working with the um, executive branch and with the National Statistical Office to identify what are data points that they particularly need timely information on. So if the government is trying to use um, a particular, sorry, it's trying to respond to a particularly timely issue, be it COVID response or disaster, you know, imminent disasters or preparedness, um, what's, what are the kinds of data they need urgently? And then we're essentially bringing in um, external expert capacity and identifying experts from across the country to help them figure out a data solution to that um, so it can inform policy making. So uh, again, this is the kind of, uh, of information, these are the kinds of data sets that we are promoting through that, those coalitions to make sure that different national stakeholders are you know, familiar with and comfortable with using these different products. So that's just a couple of ideas. But perhaps one of the colleagues wants to talk a bit more about Grid3, which is a, another very practical example of trying to encourage um, uptake of these methods. Yes, exactly. Um, Idris, you, you work on this issue quite a lot. Um, would you like to jump in here? Oh, you're just on mute there, Idris. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, uh, yes. Uh, uh, the question is what we need to do to connect policy makers and uh, researchers on this. Uh, most people are not aware of these uh, pro uh, products, the uh, graded population data sets because the use cases have not been widely demonstrated. Ideally, when you have a use case, like what I've explained on education, we encourage the Education Commission to like uh, uh, organize workshops, seminars, and then talk about it. Let people know what you are doing with this. That's the whole essence of use case. Say it out loud so that someone else somewhere can do the same, can use these data sets to get the results. So coming back to grid three, yes, grid three is doing a wonderful job. They support governments and other stakeholders in understanding how these products can be used. This is, this is very essential. If you don't understand how to harness the graded population data for evidence-based decision-making, then you're not connecting policy makers and researchers. Uh, politicians, uh, not only in Nigeria, everywhere in the world, have a number of reasons why they make certain decisions. And they have a very good way of polishing it out so you see it as if that is the best way to go about it. So, but when you have uh, a document, a documentary evidence for certain decisions, you have this data sets, it's telling you that in certain locality, in certain self settlement, there are 350 children below the age of five, and you want to carry out immunization, you know exactly where to go. So these are things that needs to be widely demonstrated so that policymakers and researchers can understand how best to harness the importance of these tools. Thank you. Maybe Alex will give more on the grid three. Thank you. If you want, I'll continue, uh, Fiona. Fiona. Um, so, uh, yeah, so thanks, Idris. Uh, Grid3 is, is uh, a partnership among uh, a number of organizations, including WorldPOP, uh, UNFPA, uh, the UN Population Fund, DFID, Gates Foundation funds that as well. And uh, this is kind of capacity building for governments, particularly uh, national statistical offices, health ministries to better develop gridded uh, or actually A, just really have good strong population data and B, then uh, how to use those data as Idris pointed out for various use cases and actually illustrate how valuable the data are for decision making. So uh, that's sort of a high level of capacity building, I would say fairly intense where there's the real country engagement and it's using the best available uh, digital technologies to first prepare the census and then um, take the census and then map it out in a way that actually provides a high population, uh, high resolution product. 
Uh, on the other side, there's the user community of uh, folks who may either for research purposes in a university or in a local NGO want to use these data. These data are not um, a mystery. You can download them, you can open them up in an open source uh, GIS package such as Quantum GIS or QGIS, and you can then do some fairly simple analyses. We even have on the PopGrid website, which we sent around earlier uh, in the chat, you can actually use a viewer to interact with the data and draw your own uh, bounding boxes and understand how many people are in an area based on the different data products. Uh, so we also want to encourage the end user to be able to better use and manipulate these data and understand their power. So I'm going to, in a moment, I'll put in the chat box, uh, there's this, um, there's, I'm sure, more than one uh, a web, en uh, web enabled or uh, basically MOOC, what we call massive online course, that allows you to better understand how to man manipulate these data for the kinds of questions that you all may have, uh, some of which came up today in the chat box. Uh, so I'll send that link around uh, to one that we've developed. It's not quite online yet, but uh, it's on the verge of being released. So I'll send the link. And if you want to learn more about how to use open source tools to manipulate these data, then that would be a good place to go. And then uh, I'm sure others may have other ideas as well that they can share in the chat box. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Yes, for everybody uh, in the audience, if you haven't seen in the chat box, there's quite a lot of links that are being shared there to various articles that can give you some more information and also links to uh, websites, data sets, products, that sort of thing. Uh, we've got a few questions that have come in from the audience. We've got a couple of um, technical questions. Perhaps Idris or Andrea, you'd like to answer this. Uh, what is the lowest unit of analysis in gridded population data? Um, and what are the minimum and maximum spatial resolution of gridded population data? Uh, we've also got a question about um, computer models for mapping water resource scarcity. Uh, Idris, would you like to start on that? Okay, yes. Uh, the minimum and maximum resolution, depending on the product you are choosing, uh, Wallpop has uh, 100 by 100 meter resolution grid cells, and then uh, some other products, they have up to one kilometer grid cells. So depending on uh, the product you are choosing. So, and that is why it is good before you choose a product, you look at uh, all of those things. So what its applications, its use, and the way the model of approach. So you now understand if it's going to suit the, uh, your methodology or your analysis, then uh, that's it. So for, for the greeded population, for example, if you're using Wallpop, it is 100 meter by 100 meter grid cell, a window. So, yeah, it's not that there is a minimum of this and a maximum of that, depending on the product and depending on how the output of that grid is. Which other question is it? Uh, I missed one question. Um, I might throw this one to Andrea because I think this is um, an area that she works on in particular. Um, okay. A computer model that's easy to use Thank for mapping you. water resource scarcity. Thanks, Idris. Uh, can I follow up a little bit with what was just being said? Yeah, sure, uh, please. Yeah, and then I'll and then I'll. It's easy for using mapping water resource scarcity. That's a good question. Uh, so the the graded products. So certain. So there are. Essentially, they could be produced at any spatial resolution, but the derived products that are off the shelf that you can go and get range from this 100 meter spatial grid, world pop data. Um, I think LandScan does somewhere around that same spatial resolution. Um, and, then you, and then there's other data sets that, that might be 250 or one kilometer resolution. And, and again, it really matters like what you're trying to use that data for as to which spatial resolution might be most appropriate. So if you're really interested in, um, so here are two examples, right? Like if you're really interested in um, getting the most spatial refinement in terms of that distribution of population, um, because you're interested in identify, identifying populations at risk to be able to lay out a plan for 
um, some kind of vaccination on the ground effort, then you might want to go with the finest resolution possible. Uh, but I've worked with climate modelers who think that one kilometer spatial resolution is incredibly detailed um, and is as fine as you need to go to be able to then couple that and do certain kinds of analyses with other types of climate data. So I think it really depends in, ter in terms of that spatial resolution. And, and for those of you who have never worked with the data, but you're, you're not finding, when you start like digging into the details and you're not finding the right spatial resolution coupled with the right data product, I guarantee you that the data producers across all these different products are really open to communication and feedback. And if you reach out to someone and say, hey, this is my problem, this is, this is the kind of data that I need, what do you think I should do? Um, and, I'll, and specifically, I, I'm happy to do this, but I I'm, I'm guarantee you there's other people across these other organizations that also would do it. Uh, you can have a conversation and figure out what would be the most suitable approach and if that approach doesn't exist then you'll probably find somebody who's willing to collaborate um, and help you with that because I think there's a huge emphasis on the producer side to make these data accessible uh, and tractable uh, uh, not only in sort of the research arena but also the development arena. The question about, uh, oh there's a bunch of questions, Where the, what was the question? It was about models and water. Yeah, water scarcity. Uh, is there one good type of model to you? I, I actually, I don't actually understand what the question is asking. Um, so the question is which computer model is easy to use for mapping water resource scarcity? Perhaps if you have some, some thoughts on, on that, maybe you could put some links into the chat. Okay. I, my, my, my initial response to that in terms of which population model would be useful would be depending on what you're using to represent water scarcity, what, other, what, what variables you're trying to use, you would wanna make sure that the, the population model that you're choosing doesn't include those data in the way that they model the population. Great, thank you. Um, so we've just got about eight or so minutes left. Um, so um, Alex, when we were chatting the other day, we were, we were talking about the future of gridded population data. Um, so what is the future of gridded population data? How can it move forward and that sort of thing? That's a great question. So one of the things that um, as an initiative, the PopGrid uh, Data Collaborative is gonna do over the coming months is, uh, and years is to validate the data products that we already have. And Idris listed them already. They're on the PopGrid website so you can take a look at the various population products out there and better understand which ones are, are most accurate. But moving forward, I think there's a recognition, uh, especially in the COVID epidemic, as we were developing our mapper, um, which I shared earlier, we were, um, well, obviously concerned by the fact that the data that we were representing were for, from a census that was a decade ago. And uh, no matter where you go in the world, you can't assume that people are staying in place for an entire decade. That's just not realistic. So I think that uh, moving forward, there's going to be a greater interest in mapping the dynamism of population. Some of that's already being done. So let's be honest, some of the products already take into account new developments in uh, areas that imply that there's new population because they use remote sensing so they can see that new housing developments are going in somewhere uh, or that new informal settlements are taking root around a, taking place around a, an urban area and the models will in fact capture that and move people into those areas based on the the known association between built environment and population but um, I think in the future we may see more use of um, uh, mobile phone data or data from, uh, you know, um, social media, big data to try to better assess where people are at any given time. Uh, someone in the, in the question Q&A asked about privacy rights, and I think this is where perhaps some of the privacy issues of use of big data in relation to where people are located could begin to emerge and obviously there's ethical issues there but um, for the kinds of applications we're talking about I don't think you need to map people at an individual level in any way down to the last meter you need to know where they are within uh, approximately a kilometer 
and you don't really need to know who they are. You just need to know that there are in fact people there and that they may have make up a, have a certain demographic makeup. So I do think we're going to see more use of um, uh, novel data sources um, and an effort to better assess where people are in real time uh, in the future. Andrea probably has additional thoughts on that. I'm sure they have some things uh, cooking in the back kitchen of World Pop that she may want to share, but uh, <laughs> that's just some thoughts off, off the cuff right now. Great, thank you. Um, Andrea, I'll invite you next, but Idris, you've got your hand up. Do you want to jump in? Oh, you're on mute again, I think, Idris. Yeah, okay. there we are. Okay, yeah, uh, we're talking about the, the future of uh, graded population data. Now we've talked about what this uh, graded population data is. It will help to identify areas or locate those people who might be left behind. And the future is to ensure that no one is left behind. So therefore, for this to happen, uh, public conversations like this on the graded population data sets needs to be uh, intensified. Also, Alex talked about the user community of graded uh, population, and I am also of the uh, opinion that it must be strengthened. I go back to grade three. What grade three is doing in Nigeria is we are building capacities in all the states in Nigeria for data producers and data users. So you identify those ministries, those agencies, government and non-governmental that are into data uh, producing data sets and also the ones that generate fundamental data sets. So we are training them, we are building capacity, we are strengthening their geospatial skills. I think that is also one of the things that will, uh, the future of this uh, greeted population. And then we talk about uh, methodology, not in detail earlier on. Uh, at the moment, there is the methodology for generating these uh, graded population data sets has not been standardized. And I think that should be done Let, when we have a standardized methodology for generating these data sets, it will go a long way and it will improve the accuracies. We're not saying they're 100% accurate, but it will improve the accuracy of that. Also, uh, validation. Whenever you have a data set, it should stand the test. It should be able to be validated. So also we should find a way to validate this data sets against real world data. Thank you very much. Thanks, Idris. Andrea, would you like to jump in? I would just reiterate some of what Alex was saying in terms of uh, the way for, well, in terms of the way forward, I think it's gonna be this integration of a variety of different types of data. It's not just about being reliant on census data that has its own error and bias associated with it for producing these gridded products, but more and more accessible and available at finer and finer spatial resolutions or other types of data products, like settlement data products that are doing an extremely good job at a global scale of identifying uh, building and, and, and settlement structures, and even going far as to getting drilling down into land use or building type. And that can help because they're, that's highly correlated with where people are. Um, but coupling that with other types of data like mobile phone records um, or other types of information uh, that might uh, be appropriate for different spatial or temporal scales. So if you're interested in understanding, say, movement of people within a smaller time frame versus sort of the standard sort of loc residential location of people, I think coupling these different kinds of data to get at certain kinds of information will be really important moving forward. And I think that also uh, just recognizing the complexity of the, the problem space in which you're trying to deal with in terms of identifying certain populations. But I mean, one example in my head that I'm thinking about is uh, collaborating with uh, people who are very much interested in slum dwellings and trying to characterize those slum areas within urban environments. And those, those areas come with their own set of 
um, complex considerations for how you approach mapping out people and resources within those areas. And so finding innovative ways for sort of merging these different types of data um, to best be able to produce information that then links back into the SDGs and being able to to monitor and to measure information is, is critical. And I think that the SDSN report at the very end does a really nice job of laying out some bullet points in terms of policymakers or people who are interested in this kind of data and how it could be tractable for the kind of considerations that you would want to think about uh, moving forward in terms of a, a choosing, choosing a, a data product to work with. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're just about out of time, but Jessica, do you want to share any final thoughts? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think everyone's raised some really great sort of next steps, if you will, for where this goes in the future. Um, I, I mean, from my perspective, the three things I was going to flag were just firstly on the subject of validation work. Um, so it just mentioned, you know, the next step we really need to take is to look at a lot of these models and how they actually um, align with or map against um, uh, data from the individual countries, so ground truth survey data or whatever it might be. And that's very, very much our plan. Um, the Pop Grid Collaborative, which is this consortium of lots of different providers working on these population methods, um, are hoping to do some validation work in select countries um, in the coming uh, months, where we will basically um, do essentially look at some of the different uh, methods, look at their particular utility for different policy problems and their relevance in different um, contexts. So that's the ambition. Apologies for um, the background noise of children, if you can hear them. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Um, so aside from validation, the next thing I wanted to mention was around research issues. I think, I mean, there's sort of countless ways you can use this information for research purposes um, and countless different dynamics we want to um, sort of dig into with best grid population data. One thing that I think is particularly interesting is urban dynamics. Um, one thing that gridded population data perhaps doesn't capture um, right now is kind of um, dip nuances in high density living. And as the world does um, urbanize and as we move to much more high density environments, we'll need to model these data sets to have a much better sense of urban dynamics. So the number of people living in you know, high density buildings, the impact of different types of, of city layouts and so on. I think that's going to be particularly important moving forward. But of course, doing that kind of analysis will require modeling um, these data sets with other inputs. So be it um, telecommunications data or other, other data sources. And that does raise some privacy um, and sort of ethical considerations. Um, the, the gridded population data that you, know, you can see on the pop grid viewer right now is sufficiently aggregated that you can't, it doesn't really raise any of those concerns. But if you start overlaying this data with you know, telecommunications data from mobile phone companies, then yes, I mean, that does raise issues. Um, and, and those are really important. And that's why it's incredibly important that there's a very strong national um, legislative and regulatory context within which this data is being used. Um, and that the telecommunications data that's being used is, is you know, handled carefully and effectively uh, with all the appropriate you know, privacies and safeguards that are associated with using that kind of information. But that will be unique and has to be tackled on a case by case basis, um, depending on the type of model that's being run, the level of, of abstraction and so on. So, you know, there will be some issues that emerge the more we mash lots of different data sets together and look at um, dynamics with even greater resolution. Um, but uh, right as of now, the greater population data sets that are currently available um, don't you know, have any of those concerns. So um, yeah, so those are my, my three. And then finally, sorry, that on I wanted a second interesting point. I, I, he alluded to capacity development. I think building up you know, more and more um, statisticians, but also just policymakers across government who are comfortable with GIS and with spatial mapping is just going to be so helpful moving forward for us to look at how these kinds of data sets can be overlaid with other survey and, um, and well-being data sets and socioeconomic variables. So moving forward, I think that should be a, a major priority for these communities. Great. Thanks Thank so you so much. Thank you. Um, it's clear that with this Brains Trust and with this um, audience that we've got today, that this discussion could continue for a long time. Thank you, everybody, for your time and your input today. Um, and thanks for everybody who's jumping into the chat there and creating a really good discussion. Uh, and thanks to everybody who's sharing resources. Um, so I think um, Today we've learned that now the more than ever reliable and timely population data is critical to ensure that no one is left behind and gridded population data can clearly play an important role in this.